Uh, welcome everybody to the November 2017 uh, Wilmington Coin Club presentation. Today I'm pleased to announce Garrett is our speaker, Garrett Ziss, and tonight's topic is Baltimore's Washington Mining and its Numismatic Secrets. Thank you, Garrett. You're welcome. All right, this presentation is actually a story that takes place over the span of 208 years. All right, the story starts in 1809 when a group of Baltimore citizens wanted to honor George Washington by erecting a monument. They claimed it would stimulate the young to emulation to noble and honorable actions. These citizens may have been patriotic, but they also had an ulterior motive. The Baltimore courthouse on Calvert Street was about to be raised and the surrounding neighborhood was concerned about the type of building that would replace it. So as an alternative, they proposed the monument to Washington. The Maryland legislature approved the project and appointed a 23-member board of managers to supervise it. Their first task was fundraising. In 1810, the state of Maryland granted permission for the use of lotteries to raise $100,000 for the monument's construction. A total of six lotteries were held over the span of 14 years, and here is an image of one of the lottery tickets. The Board of Managers' second task was to find an architect to design the monument. So in 1813, an architectural contest was held to find the best monument design that would cost no more than $100,000 to build. Both European and American architects submitted entries, and the results were announced on May 2, 1814. The winning architect was 33-year-old Robert Mills from Charleston, South Carolina. He was one of the first totally American-trained architects. Mills highlighted his American birth and training in his submission to the Board of Managers and said, For the honor of our country, my sincere wish is that it may not be said, To foreign genius and to foreign hands we are indebted for a monument to perpetuate the glory of our beloved chief. Here is a drawing of Mills' winning design. Each of these seven sections represented an important event in George Washington's life, and the top of the monument showed Washington riding in the chariot of victory. However, when the neighborhood citizens saw that the monument would be a tall marble pillar, they were afraid it would blow over in a storm and fall on their houses. <laughs> so therefore, they decided that they did not want the monument to be built in their neighborhood after all. So in stepped John Eager Howard. He served under Washington in the Revolutionary War, so he gladly donated 40,000 square feet of land for the monument outside of the city of Baltimore in what was called Howard's Woods. Here is a map of Baltimore to give you some perspective. The bottom dot is the Baltimore Convention Center, where many of you have attended the Whitman Expo. The center dot was the proposed site for the monument on Calvert Street. The top dot is the actual site of the Washington Monument. As you can see, it's no longer in a wooded area and is now part of the city. The monument's cornerstone was laid in a ceremony on July 4th, 1815, and over 25,000 people attended. Baltimore was especially proud because it was just eight months after the Battle of Baltimore where they won a crucial victory against the British in the War of 1812. During the celebration, speeches were given in Washington's honor, there was a 39-gun salute, and the night was capped off by fireworks. The column of the Washington Monument was completed in 1825, and here is a drawing of it. As you can see, it's quite different from Mill's original design, which had to be scaled back over the years to cut costs. In 1826, the Board of Managers held another contest to find a sculptor to carve Washington's statue for the top of the monument. 
Italian sculptor Enrico Kozicki won the competition. His design depicts Washington relinquishing his post as Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army on December 23, 1783, in Annapolis, Maryland. The chariot Mills originally envisioned was eliminated due to cost. The monument was completed on November 25, 1829, when Washington's statue was hoisted into place. Its final cost was $203,764.08, which translates to over $5 million today. After the Baltimore Washington Monument, architect Robert Mills went on to design several buildings in Washington, D.C., including that other, more famous Washington Monument in 1836. In 1851, the Baltimore Washington Monument was mentioned by Herman Melville in Chapter 35 of Moby Dick, and here is what he wrote. Great Washington, too, stands high aloft on his towering main mast in Baltimore, and like one of Hercules' pillars, his column marks that point of human grandeur beyond which few mortals will go. <clears throat> this grand monument was continuously exposed to the elements, and over time, it deteriorated. Due to safety concerns, the monument was closed in June 2010. Both the exterior and the interior of the monument were restored by the Mount Vernon Place Conservancy. The $5.5 million project was started in January 2014 and yielded a few surprises. In October 2014, a time capsule contained in a sealed copper box was discovered behind this bronze plaque in the monument wall. Both the time capsule and the plaque were added to the monument during a 1915 centennial celebration. Mm. However, over the years, the existence of the time capsule had been forgotten. The capsule contained more than 50 objects, including seven U.S. coins from that time period. The coins are listed and pictured here. The capsule also contained several artifacts related to the centennial of the Star-Spangled Banner, including a centennial medal. In February 2015, the original 1815 time capsule was discovered in the monument's northeast cornerstone. The restoration team previously knew of the time capsule's existence, but its exact location was unknown. The contents of the capsule included a copy of President Washington's farewell address and a copy of a Baltimore newspaper printed on July 3rd, 1815. The newspaper was opened to a page that contained a reprint of the Declaration of Independence. Then, the paper was laid on top of these jars. So when the time capsule was opened, it was the first thing they saw. This shows just how important our national independence was to the people who built the monument. A collection of coins was also found in the time capsule. They were found in the bottom of this jar and were individually wrapped and labeled. The restoration of the monument was completed in time for a monumental bicentennial celebration on July 4th, 2015. Activities included a naturalization ceremony, a rededication and reopening of the monument, and a country fair. So by now, you're probably thinking, well, that was pretty interesting, but this is a coin club meeting, so when is he going to focus on coins? Well, I can assure you that the time is almost here. If you would excuse me for a minute, I'm taking a drink. <laughs> Okay. Just four months after the Washington Monument's bicentennial celebration, my parents and I spent a weekend in Baltimore. On Saturday, November 7th, we attended the Baltimore Whitman Expo, and on Sunday, we decided to visit the Maryland Historical Society. 
The reason for our visit was to see the original version of the Star Spangled Banner, which is on display at the museum. Here is an image of this amazing historical document. After viewing this exhibit, we explored the rest of the museum. There were many great exhibits, but the one that really caught my attention was this one. At the time, I didn't know anything about Baltimore's Washington Monument. Sounds familiar, right? <laughs> but as a numismatist, I was immediately drawn to this display. <laughs> the display contained 10 early U.S. coins and two medals from the Washington Monument's 1815 time capsule. I was excited to see them and took pictures of their obverses. However, as a member of the John Wright Collector Society and Early American Coppers, I was disappointed that their dye marriages were not attributed. So shortly after my visit, I wrote to the Maryland Historical Society to see if I could obtain reverse images of the coins in order to attribute their dye marriages. They responded right away, but unfortunately, they did not have reverse images of the coins. So at that point, I wasn't sure what to do, so my project was pretty much on hold. Then, this past December, I discovered new images of these three gold coins on a Dropbox gallery. They were posted by Lance Humphreys, Executive Director of the Mount Vernon Place Conservancy. I contacted him, and that's when my project really became interesting. Our initial correspondence centered around this gentleman, Robert Gilmore Jr. Robert Gilmore Jr. was an original member of the Board of Managers for the Baltimore Washington Monument. He was also its president from 1819 until it was disbanded in 1842. So he was really a key figure in the project. Gilmore was a wealthy businessman and a patron of the arts. He collected a variety of things, such as paintings, autographs, mineral specimens, and coins. In fact, Robert Gilmore Jr. was a pioneer American numismatist. <laughs> he was our country's first systematic coin collector, and he came close to completing a date set of U.S. coins. In an 1841 letter, Gilmore said, I began many years ago and have collected every gold, silver, and copper coin issued from the mint which was to be had. With all my industry and perseverance, I am yet deficient in seven gold coins, an eagle of 1802 among them, ten silver ones, and three copper. Unfortunately, only one coin from Gilmore's collection can be traced back to his ownership, and that's the 1787 Brasher doubloon that's pictured here. After Gilmore, it was owned by collectors such as Harold Newland, Robert Colton Davis, James Ten Eyck, and Virgil Brand. It last sold at the 2014 Fun Show for over $4.5 million. So let's just think about this for a minute. In Gilmore's day, there were no coin dealers or coin shows, and no coin books or the internet. Plus, there weren't any public mint records, so Gilmore often hunted for coins that didn't exist, such as the 1802 eagle that he mentioned in his letter. So what did he do to compensate for his lack of resources? Gilmore used two important connections to his advantage. The first was his niece's <coughs> excuse me. The first was his niece's husband, Benjamin Chu Howard, a congressman who had access to the annual mint reports from the Library of Congress. With these mint reports, Gilmore could determine what coins were produced in a certain year and then only search for those coins. His second connection was Adam Eckfeld, chief coiner of the U.S. Mint. In 1841, Gilmore wrote, The Mint has aided me considerably and has even provided my desiderata from the old dyes when I require it. Mr. Eckfeld of the Mint has been of great service to me. So instead of coin dealers and coin shows, Gilmore had something even better, 
access to the mint's coin dies through Eckfeld. The practice of recoining may seem shocking to us today, but it was not frowned upon in Gilmore's day. Later documentation also makes it clear that it was Adam Eckfeld who assisted Gilmore, and not his son Jacob or nephew George. <coughs> Excuse me. 1836 was a great numismatic year for Gilmore because Eckfeld sent him an example of every regular issue coin, pattern coin, and medal struck by the mint that year, and here is the list. It's amazing just how complete it is. The regular issue coins included both a lettered edge and readed edge half dollar, as well as the rare proof half cent. The pattern coins included a bill and two cent piece, which was never made for general circulation because it could be pickled in acid so it looked like a silver coin. Eckfeld's package also contained a fur steam coinage medal, which commemorated the first steam-powered coining press installed at the Philadelphia Mint in 1836. This information on Robert Gilmore Jr. came from two articles that appeared in the November and December 1996 issues of the Numismatist. They were co-authored by Lance Humphreys and Numismatist Joel Oros. Dr. Humphreys and Dr. Oros are teaming up again to write about the Baltimore-Washington Monument's 1815 and 1915 time capsules. For their publication, the coins and medals from the two time capsules were professionally photographed on March 30th, 2017 at the Maryland Historical Society. I was invited to attend the photo shoot and examine these items and it was one of the best numismatic experiences I've ever had. <coughs> Here is a picture from the photo shoot. We are examining the paper wrappers from the 1815 time capsule. On the left is Joel Oros, in the center is Lance Humphreys, and on the right is numismatic photographer John Baumgart. In this picture, we are hard at work examining and documenting the coins. Excuse me. Okay. Now, let's take a closer look at the coins and medals from the 1815 time capsule. It contained three gold coins. The first one was an 1801 Drake Bust Eagle, and its die marriage is BD2. A die marriage is a specific combination of an obverse die and a reverse die. The second one is an 1802 over 1 Drake Bust Half Eagle, and its die marriage is BD5. This die marriage is quite rare, with only 8 to 10 specimens known. The third one is an 1807 Drake Bust Quarter Eagle, and its die marriage is BD1. The reverse die used to produce this coin was a real workhorse. It was used to strike all of the 1805, 1806, and 1807 quarter eagles, plus all of the 1807 Drake Bust dimes. This was well over, excuse me, well over 100,000 coins. The 1815 time capsule also contained five silver coins and as you would expect, they are heavily oxidized. The first one is a 1799 over 8 Drake Bust Dollar, and its die marriage is BB142. This coin is nicely toned on the reverse, and appears to have reacted with the paper it was wrapped in. The second one is an 1811 Cap Bust Half Dollar, and its die marriage is 0111. The third silver coin is an 1807 Drake Bust Quarter Dollar, and its die marriage is B2. Interestingly, only about 20% of this coin's edge is readed. <coughs> Excuse me. Battling a little bit of a cold here, so bear with me. Uh, the fourth one is an 1809 Cap Bust Dime, and its die marriage is JR1. 
The final silver coin is an 1803 Drake Fust half dime, and its die marriage is LM1. This die marriage is quite rare, with only 13 to 30 specimens known. The 1815 time capsule also contained two copper coins. The first one is an 1812 classic head cent, and its die marriage is S288. Despite the environmental damage, it's really a beautiful coin. The second one is an 1806 straight bust half cent, and its die marriage is C4. The six and the date is boldly repunched, making it the scarcer Manly Die State 1.0. <clears throat> the 1815 time capsule also contained two other numismatic items. The first one is a copper 1812 Duke of Wellington token. The obverse shows a bust of Wellington, and the reverse highlights Wellington's involvement in the Peninsular Wars. It isn't clear why this token was included in a time capsule, but there are no mysteries why this next item was included. It's an 1807 George Washington Sansa medal, which commemorated Washington's retirement from public service in 1797. The obverse shows a bust of Washington and is based on a drawing by Gilbert Stuart. The reverse shows a sword, fasces, and a wreath sitting on a table that displays the United States shield. This medal was struck at the mint for wealthy Philadelphian Joseph Sansom. The dies for this medal were prepared by none other than John Reich, who is the assistant engraver at the Mint from 1807 until 1817. He designed the cat bust silver and gold coins, as well as the classic head copper coins. The George Washington Sansa medal was produced in three medals, silver, bronze, and white metal. At the photo shoot, we compared the weight of this Sansa metal to documented weights for each composition and determined that this metal is silver. The silver variant of the metal is quite rare, with only six to seven specimens known. So that concludes the numismatic items from the 1815 time capsule. <coughs> this presentation has been an overview of the historic Baltimore Washington Monument and its remarkable time capsules. Dr. Humphreys and Dr. Oros will cover this topic in much greater detail in their upcoming publication, including much more information about the numismatic items from the 1915 time capsule. I am two years older and five inches taller than when I started this project. <laughs> More importantly, though, I'm a lot more knowledgeable. In the short time I've been a numismatist, I've learned that you never know where a numismatic project will lead you or what path it will take. Sometimes you have to be patient, but in the end, you will always be more knowledgeable than when you started. When I started this project, my goal was to attribute the die marriages of the coins from the Washington Monument's 1815 time capsule. However, before I knew it, I was drawn in by the history and was learning about the Baltimore-Washington Monument, Robert Gilmore Jr., and even the Duke of Wellington. I also never imagined that I would get a chance to actually hold and examine these historic coins and medals. For that opportunity, I would like to thank the Maryland Historical Society, Lance Humphreys, and the Mount Vernon Place Conservancy, the Newman Numismatic Portal, and Joel Oros. Thank you for listening. Are there any questions?